I'm Joan Fickey. I'm the interim provost. This is our third guest speaker in the Provost Scholar Series. I would say something like, leaving the best for last. No, I shouldn't do that. Uh, but I just did. Uh, I'm thrilled about this series. I had absolutely nothing to do with it, obviously. It's been at San Jose State for years and years and years. And if you have been with us on the other occasions, I'm going to repeat myself and just bear with me. I really genuinely believe that this is the heart and soul of San Jose State University. The work that the faculty do, the scholarship that gets provided by our scholars is instrumental in generating the reputation of San Jose State. So it is really absolutely a joy for me to be able to participate in this series and pretend that I had something to do with it. When in fact, the real work is always done by the faculty and it's a delight to see how many of you are really able to free up your schedules to come and hear those very same faculty when they make these presentations. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Martin Luther King Library for its support. This is a wonderful room. I see the dean. I thought I saw the dean. Did I see the dean? There's the dean. Dean Elliott, thank you very much. And more importantly, it's Wendy, right, Wendy? Wave? Yes, thank you. She makes all of this work. And of course, the folks, thank you. And of course, the folks in my office, it's typically Melanie and Jessica, and I think Jessica is with us today. Jessica, can you wave? She yelled at the food service. There was nothing green to eat with your lunch. Is it, has it arrived yet? Not yet. OK, well, don't get up while Carlos is speaking. Um, if you want something green with your lunch, you're going to have to wait a bit. So without delaying this any further, uh, I believe that Carlos Alberto Sanchez is well known to all of you on campus. He has already been the recipient of the President's Presidential Scholar Award, and I believe has done at least one, if not more, of these lunchtime one series lectures for us. It's quite remarkable that we have someone who's a repeater and someone who is also a presidential scholar. His research focuses on the philosophy of violence, and he is in fact, in, in fact the philosophy department here in the College of Humanities and Arts at San Jose State. So Carlos, I took the time to look up philosophy because I'm a little intimidated by the field. And what it says is it's the study of nature, the nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. Well, my personal philosopher is Lily Tomlin. And she says that reality is a collective hunch. <laughs> so I think we're going to hear more than just that today. We're going to hear about, and you can see the title, the philosophy after narco culture. He said you're going to lose your appetites when he gets into this, but probably not so much. In any case, Professor Sanchez is currently the graduate advisor for the MA program in philosophy, the editor of the American Philosophical Association newsletter on Hispanic and Latino issues in philosophy, chair of Inter-American Relations for the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy, has authored I see different numbers, three to five books. Five? Five. Mm, he tossed it off like that, five. Five books, co-editor of a few critical anthologies and has penned dozens of articles on phenomenology and Mexican philosophy. So we have a real treat for us today, Professor Sanchez. Thank you, uh, Provost uh, Fiki, for uh, inviting me. and. Uh, allowing me to share this this work, uh, it's um, it's a new area for me, a new uh, fairly new area of research for me. I've been I, the last ten years I've been working on the history of Mexican philosophy, and I've done a lot of uh, work on that. And uh, it was just a natural um, transition to start thinking about violence in Mexico. For me, it was natural for me, um, and uh, so I started working on this uh, this project about uh, two years ago. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, it comes from a book manuscript that I'm uh, supposed to be turning in in a couple of weeks, uh, and um, and that and the, the the book is called "A Sense of Brutality: Philosophy After Our Culture." Um, and so today I wanted to uh, present the the preface or the introduction to that book, but I think I want to skip around a little bit um, because. I just felt like I should do that last night. Uh, so um, 
so there, there will be some things that might uh, keep your lunch, uh, that might, might unsteady your stomach once at once I get rolling, but not, not too much. Um, OK, so I start uh, my, my considerations here with, or this is my outline. Why am I doing this? Uh, what's the matter? And then there's going to be an interlude, and then I'm going to talk about brutality at the, at, at the end. I begin uh, with, with a quote from John Dewey, who says that the task of future philosophy is to clarify men's ideas as to the social and moral strifes of their own day. And with Carl Jaspers, philosophy exists wherever thought brings men to an awareness of their existence. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit and then stop and consider stuff. This book... Uh, it deals with a phenomenon that may seem to fall outside the purview of philosophy, considered in its traditional sense as a human preoccupation with the eternal and the universal. The phenomenon in question is the unmitigated savagery, savagery related to narcotics trafficking, or to put it in terms we will use here, the phenomenon that preoccupies us is narco-violence, or the violence of narco-culture. <laughs> Offered here are thus a series of philosophical reflections after narcoculture. With the phrase after narcoculture, I mean that the philosophical reflections are motivated by the violence and death that char characterizes this form of life. Now, I knew that a lot of people wouldn't know what narcoculture was. So I have here uh, a, a short description that appeared in the Mexican uh, magazine Excelsior. Narcoculture impregnates a Mexican society, making its way not only into the arts, but also into a form of life. To speak of narcoculture is to speak about the proliferation of products that articulate narco-trafficking in literature, music, and movie screens. It is to speak about the manner in which its roots are found intimately planted in Mexican society. So when we talk about narcoculture, uh, we're talking about these uh, different cultural products that make it up. Uh, but one of the things that is always left out of this uh, description is violence, okay? and the fact that it is a very violent culture. And, and I'll get to that in a second. With over a quarter of a million, one quarter of a million narco-related deaths in Mexico alone since 2006, when the administration of then Fel uh, President Felipe Calderón declared war against narco-trafficking, narco-culture represents a historical event that demands a philosophical response. Similar to French philosophers, who philosophized after Auschwitz, uh, Mexican philosophers who philosophized after Tlatelolco, uh, and the American philosophers who philosophized after 9-11, these reflections assume that the occasion of 250,000 deaths well into the 21st century forces us to interrogate our most basic assumptions regarding human sociality. <laughs> With this in mind, what follows are meditations on various aspects of narco-culture that while starting from the concreteness of that culture, represent meditations on some of our most basic philosophical concepts, like culture itself, violence, brutality, personhood, and politics. So my assumption is that if, if we consider narco-culture um, as a space of, with cultural productions and violence and brutality, with all these things existing together, that it gives us an opportunity to reflect philosophically and to reconsider some very simple concepts, like personhood, uh, and politics. Uh, what, what, what happens to politics and our notions of personhood with, within the space of narcoculture? Again, it seems like too specific, concrete, or temporal, to temporally relative a topic to require a philosophical intervention. Someone might point out that, the thinking, that thinking philosophically about narcoculture, the culture of narcotics trafficking in Mexico, more specifically, is like thinking about the universal significance of a speech pattern found only in Northern Ireland, because philosophy is supposed to deal with universal concepts, universal ideas. Okay. That is a phenomenon too localized to matter to philosophers, but I disagree. Narcoculture and the violence that constitutes it is a symptom, symptom of a mar much larger crisis. We, could, we can say that it is a, a symptomatic of a human crisis, but if generalizations are to be avoided, it is certainly symptomatic of an Amer American crisis. For instance, the very history of Mexican narcoculture is tethered to the history of America's war on mind-altering substances. It is, in effect, its dialectical residue, 
As it changes and morphs and evolves with every law and regulation, U.S. lawmakers invent to curb or combat the sale, consumption, and traffic of illicit drugs. While the dialectical substitution of America's legal machinery more and more criminalizes drug use and sale, uh, pushing consumers and producers alike further and further into the periphery of legality, Mexican narcoculture flourishes and becomes mainstream, turning Mexico at the dawn of the 21st century, according to the British journalist Yohan Grillo, into a bloodbath that has shocked the world. Now, um, this, this thing about uh, narco culture's relationship with American uh, legal policy is, is a very interesting one. I have, I've, had, I've had a lot of conversations with, uh, with people that are benefiting from this culture. <laughs> and uh, and they're, they're very, very excited about the possibility of Trump building his wall. Right? They're very excited about that possibility. Now, why would, you, why would he, they be excited? Well, because the harder that Trump or that the United States makes it for the drugs to get by, the more expensive they'll be. And the more expensive they'll be, the more money they'll make. So they're extremely happy. Now you ask them, yeah, but if they put a big old wall and make it harder for you to pass the drugs over, how are you going to do it? And they always think, they always say, well, we'll figure it out. And my joke, my, my joke is that, that these guys eventually, when things get really hard, they're going to invent the, the teletransporter that, that you see on Star Wars and Star Trek, right? I mean, they're, they're going to invent something to, to make this happen because they have the money and the resources. So that's, you know, there's, there's a relation there. If John Dewey is right, and the task, of, uh, the task of philosophy today, or Dewey's future philosophy is in my mind today's philosophy, is to clarify our ideas as to the social and moral strifes of our own day, then thinking of the violence of narcoculture certainly qualifies as a topic that philosophers should be worried about. After all, the indiscriminate murder of thousands of people on a monthly basis for reasons related to the particular workings of a specific cultural complex, one that plays out in our own day, certainly counts as social and moral strife. I agree with Dewey that something like this should matter to philosophy. Someone will object that Dewey's proclamation was simply a result of his pragmatist commitment and that he meant something else by that statement. It could be that by social moral strifes, he meant social moral disagreements in general, conceptual confusions that lead to social moral issues in general, and that strife so specific that its actors could be pointed out and named. Perhaps, but this call for a more radical and situated engagement with the world around us is emblematic of what we could call the radical branch of philosophy. Thus, we find the call for such engagement in the 11th thesis of Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, where he tells us that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways when the point is to change it. We find it in Jose, Jose Ortega y Gasset, who, after proposing the principle that I am myself and my circumstance, or that my circumstances and are intimately tied with my identity, that I am my circumstance and that my circumstances are me, he immediately demands engagement, saying, if I don't save my circumstance, I don't save myself. This project of thinking philosophically about situated violence is thus philosophically justified on pragmatic and Marxist grounds. But my proclivities, my own proclivities, tend towards phenomenological existentialism, and I consider this project to be first and foremost phenomenological and existential. My analysis will thus be, direct, will thus be directed to the given in the circumstance, to the phenomena, and from there extract meaning and essence. And then I have a long quote by Carl Jaspers that I won't read. Familiar scenes broadcast on television or computer screens are these. Dead bodies strewn across their roads, riddled with bullets to head, chest, and stomach, and their faces. Headless corpses left inside abandoned cars, heads atop the car's roof, in the trunk, or just missing. The noticeable profile of human bodies wrapped with black trash bags or blankets leaning lazily against walls or fences. In many cases, written confessions accompany the crimes detailing the reasons for the executions, decapitations, or dismemberments, and the people or persons responsible. These written confessions are known as narcomantas, or narco banners. The writers are narcos, and they are commonplace in what is known as narco culture. For curious Americans, those on this side of the border, perusing the pages of Mexican newspapers or clicking on the links dedicated to Mexico on, or the war on drugs or violence on CNN or the websites of Fox or whatever, these things are troubling reminders that this kind of gruesome and otherwise unthinkable violence remains a possibility outside conditions of war and in spite of our purported human advancements. Although these scenes unfold in places and contexts usually unfamiliar to us, we're all witnesses 
We have our purported advancements to thank for that. And as witnesses, the violence we witness is itself demanding our response. We are asked by the things themselves to respond somehow, but specifically to respond in understanding. But how do we respond in understanding to this kind of violence? After all, this is a violence of an everyday type that is much more horrific, cruel, and brutal than what anyone should be used to. In what follows, we will try to understand this violence philosophically, or better yet, phenomenologically. To begin, consider the following headlines detailing everyday car cartel or narco violence. And I took these headlines, you know, three or four months ago. I could jump into the newspapers today and they would be the same or worse. So, uh, this one says, five decapitated, he decapitated hearts left in mouths of severed heads. Now, you don't have to, like in, in Mexico, when you're going, when you go to the, to the grocery store, uh, you're, you have your eggs and your tortillas, and then right in front of you is a magazine with that headline accompanied by a picture. Right? So they're not just telling you, they're showing you, right? Um, it, it's, it's pretty gruesome. Uh, in this gruesome scene, uh, in the tourist mecca of Cancun, Quintana Roo, authorities find five headless corpses inside a car, their heads mounted on the car's hood, and thereabouts, the mouths of the heads were sewn with, shut with steel wire. When opened, it was discovered that they were stuffed with a dead men's hearts. Uh, this one's, the, the title for this one is Shilling Scene of the Narco Wars as two dismembered bodies found in Mexico City. Uh, this was, was a strange one because Mexico City for a long time has claimed that the narco war is not affect it, right? But it's affecting it for sure. Um, uh, this one, uh, the DEA warns of a circle of hell in Mexico in 2017. <clears throat> the bullet-ridden bodies of the M Martinez children were found, found in a bloody floor curled up next to the bodies of their parents in a small rented apartment. The reason for their untimely death seems to be that the father of the children was thought to be involved with a group of assassins who killed a rival cult cartel member. No proof of complicity or connection was ever established here. This one, it turned out to be a grave. Seven decomposed bodies are found in a narco fosa. The, the word narco fosa means uh, a grave where the narcos are throwing their bodies. And they're very common. Uh, I have a colleague in the University of Puebla who has mapped uh, the place with little red dots and the map. The, the, with little red, he, he's put little red dots in the map of Mexico where all the narco fosas have been found. And it's all red. <laughs> they're all over the place. Okay? Um, so, so this one, they, they, found, uh, they found seven decomposed bodies. Uh, previously, in the, same neighborhood, in the same neighborhood, 28 bodies have been exhumed from a different narco fosa. The identities of the victims remain unknown. Uh, so this is a very common practice. What is, what is the common denominator to these headlines and the stories they tell? So that's where I do the phenomenology part. What is the invariant kernel of truth that connects them all? If we think of these and all possible stories that one could tell about narco violence, what is it that remains unchanged about them all? In a preliminary way, we can say that the invariant is the obvious fact that the violence manifested in these acts always is, is always more than the violence required to bring about human death. The violence in these cases is excessive. And we would say, we also like to say, actually, unspeakable. We use the word unspeakable. Right? It's unspeakable. It's unthinkable. It's unimaginable. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, why do we use those words right? to, say, to, to describe these, these acts? Words fail when description is attempted. This excessiveness appears prima facie as the invariant kernel of narco violence. It is, with, it is, we say preliminarily, its phenomenological core. But what kind of violence is that violence that is always more than violence? To think that it is just simply violence underdetermines the, those acts in question. Violence, when it, when it is simply violence, can be said to be formative in the constitution of subjectivity so that war, trauma, and other types of death struggles help make us who we are. Uh, one such view, uh, on such a view, uh, which I do not endorse, violence is creative and redeeming, while also that which serves as a horizon for the creation and redemption of persons. Uh, an example of this philosophy of violence that says that violence is creative and redeeming is Franz Fanon and Jean-Paul Sartre, who believe that and the struggle, the death struggles that go, on along, uh, go along with revolution, people are recreate themselves, he says. I don't agree with that. But perhaps these acts of excessive violence, of a violence that is, in a, that is excessive, that is too much and unimaginable, while not seeming to fit the concept in a straightforward way, 
are just another facet of the concept of violence and not something else. The philosopher Slavov Zizek uh, suggests three ways to think about violence. Uh, quick note, uh, if you are interested in what philosophers are like today and want to laugh at the same time, uh, Zizek is a very interesting character that you can find on, on YouTube. He has tons of videos and he's hilarious. So, um, but he's also crazy, but, but it's, it's, it's a good combination of crazy and hilarious and he's always sweating, so it's weird. <laughs> Um, so the, the philosopher Zizek suggests three ways to think about violence, symbolic, subjective, and objective violence. Symbolic violence is the violence of ideology, the violence of meta-narratives that oppress and victimize groups of people. The dominating narratives that sustain patriarchy and whiteness are symbolic vi symbolically violent, for example. Subjective violence is the violence attributed to subjects, to psychopaths, and resentful men. And objective violence is the violence which Zizek says is systematic, inherent in the system, uncanny, anonymous, and yet determining of what happens in our everyday lives. It is the violence of capitalism, of the 1% over the 99, the invisible violence of white privilege and masculinity. These three ways of conceptualizing violence seem to capture most of those realities that we think about when we think about violence. The violence of ideas, the violence of subjects, and the violence of institutions and systems. In a certain sense, violence in the narco context can be said to be objective in Zizek's trichotomy. As the examples above show, this kind of violence is not uncommon. We will even say that it is everyday or anonymous and normalized or inherent in the system. However, what narco violence also shows is an, is an excessiveness which is unspeakable or unimaginable that seems to fall outside a space of justification or utility that does not fit the system or cohere within the space of the rational. Perhaps this excessiveness is that uncanniness of objective violence as Zizek points out the ability of violent excess to sink into the social fabric, social fabric and become anonymous or muted, as Hannah Arendt will say about a violence that is no longer rational. But there is something more to this violence that in its excess transcends. This excessive violence is, that, is, is thus something that we see, but at the same time, at the same time, it denies articulation. And we tell ourselves we cannot imagine it or speak it. It is it is too, it is, in, it is, in, it is this, this presence and absence of this particular kind of violence that I refer to when I say that the violence of narco culture is more than violence. In other words, the idea is that the reality of the violent act in the narco context overflows or can be fully captured by the concept of violence. It can be subjective, as we will see, but it can also be symbolic while also being objective. The violence of narco culture can be all of these three things, subjective, objective, and symbolic, and then more. Hence, it must be called by another name. So I call it brutality, whose logic I will try to show at the end here demands that we not recognize it as brutality in order to dehumanize, objectify, and destroy human life. So when I get to the end, we're going to get to see that the concept of brutality has its own logic. And its logic demands that you don't see it. But we'll get to that. Um, the logic of brutality, that is, says that a human is not a human, but an object, whether it can be killed and deconstituted because it is an object. And so in the act of killing and deconstituting it, it is, it's, it, it ceases being brutality. But I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, if Hannah Arendt, uh, as, if, as Hannah Arendt says, violence is neither beastly nor irrational, and brutality is the name for that which is more than violence, then the goal is to... An, the goal is to unmask brutality, its pre pretense to irrationality, to absence, and thus to name it, to expose it, and to bring it into full presence. I am convinced that narco culture provides that space of intelligibility where we can do this. Now, one of the, one, one of the major, uh, uh, I, I presented this, the variations of these papers in Mexico, and, um, and one, of the, one of the critiques is always, well, are you saying that if, 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 if brutality marks narco culture, are you saying that people that exist in the narco culture are brutal? Right? In other words, are they brutes? Are they barbarians? Um, in which case, you know, I'm saying something pretty damning. Uh, so I decided to make a case that that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, in making these claims and even in undertaking this project, I am running the risk 
of characterizing persons who exist within the space of narco culture or in those sectors of the Mexican community where it is found as savages or uncivilized brutes. It is thus imperative to append this criticism and propose that the unmitigated brutality of narco culture represents one aspect of civilized society, namely the extreme limit of a neoliberal capitalism and hyper-consumer culture. However, it is hard to dis dis disassociate brutality from cultural backwardness. Mexicans themselves have a hard time making this distinction. Recently, a wave of cartel violence in the states of Veracruz and Guerrero left 18 dead within a 24-hour period, prompting the governor of Veracruz, Miguel Angel Yunes, to make the following decla decla declaration. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Did I miss another one? I don't, I don't have that here. These are cowardly acts, he says, filled with vileness that give us some idea as to what we are facing. We are not facing human beings. We are facing beasts, cowards, villains, persons who are capable of murdering children with the aim of holding our people hostage. The danger with such a, so that's, that's newness. The danger with such a characterization is that it places the blame on the irrational elements of the culture, on the psychopaths, the sick, while, si while simultaneously distracting from the circumstance that allows and requires such acts to take place to take place. The beastly, vile, and cowardly acts are, a par are part of a system of allowances connected with an economy and a politics of excess. An editorial in a Mexican journal attempted to sort out the philosophy of the narco, narco trafficker. And to their credit, the editors were able to reduce into one dicho, or a saying, uh, pinpointing what this philosophy was in essence. They write, the philosophy of narco culture was synthesized by a low-level provincial assassin in an interview of it after his capture. He says, Es mejor vivir cinco años como rey que cincuenta años como buey. Now, if, um, for those of you that don't speak Spanish, uh, it can be translated as, it's better to live five years as a king than 50 years as a poor, dumb idiot. This philosophy, they continue, palpitates in an, in an entire culture. And it is its core, and its core are two maxims. Um, the first one, fast money with little effort, and two, an asphyxiating material consumerism. Well, this philosophy is more akin to a mantra and appears somewhat irrational. It is the most rational perspective one can have in a world that promotes such things as asphyxiating materialism, that values luxury and wealth, and that measures success in the registers of excess. But this mantra is not only a reflection of the culture, it is also a result of it. One has to live this way. It is demanded by the, it is de it is demanded by the system of allowances, namely by the culture itself. So the violence announced in the headlines, the visceral brutality of the acts and the culture that allows it. These are not irrational or barbaric, but part of the rational system of capitalist consumption of which narco-trafficking, narco-war, narco-violence are a part. Now, um, one, one of the philosophers that, uh, that I use to kind of back up my, my idea that this, the brutality of narco culture is not uh, indicative of brutes or savages uh, is Michel Henry, uh, the French philosopher, who says that barbarism, he says, barbarism is not a beginning. It is always the second to a state of culture that necessarily precedes it. And it is only in relation to this prior culture that it can appear as an impoverishment and a degeneration. Barbarism is ruin not rudiment. Culture is thus always first. So my idea here is that uh, narco culture is culture. Right? Uh, and, and somebody's going to reply to me and say, well, it's more like a subculture. And my answer is no, because you're, you're saying that there is such a thing as a culture. Uh, you're, you're saying that there's such a thing as a homogeneous culture, and every other culture is a subculture to it. And I don't, I don't think, I'm not a totalizing philosopher like that. I think that um, the narco culture is, is a culture with its own rules and its own products. Uh, and barbarism is a function or is a consequence uh, of that. So brutality is a consequence of that. OK. So, um, so that's, that's a quote there. Now I'm going to dig into the interlude that I promised. Um, now, an interlude is, is something that kind of just pops out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, my, my favorite uh, philosopher, Kierkegaard, has this great book. And then in the middle of it, he has an interlude where you, you're thinking, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, so that's, that's what an interlude is for me. And so this is my interlude. And, it's, uh, and, and it has to do with uh, 
Los Jardines de Omaya. Now, if, uh, when, when, I, when I went to Culiacán um, the, for the first time a few years back to present some of this work, uh, it's a very, you know, it's, it's a very uh, dangerous place, but uh, it's the center, the core of narco culture. Um, and I was taken on a tour of this cemetery, Los Jardines de Omaya, which is the narco cemetery. That's where they all end up, right? Um, and, uh, and it was when I was taking this tour through the Los, Los Jardines that I realized that I was dealing with a culture, a real culture, uh, with its own rules and its own ideologies and its own ideas and its own philosophies, and, and I needed to explore this more. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me go through this interlude here. A central theme of the present book my, is that the scenes of violence just illustrated above are not isolated events that manifest in the extremities and excesses of cultures, that they are not nonsensical eruptions of barbarism and brutality exhibiting the dialectical nature of cultural progress. The claim of this book is that such extreme violence constitutes narco-culture, and thus that extreme violence can be constitutive of culture itself. The objection may be raised that narco-culture is not culture, but a sub of marginal culture. Right? So I already talked about that. On a recent trip to Culiacán, Sinaloa, I was given access to the famed Los Jardines de Omaya. By all accounts, Los Jardines de Omaya is a cemetery. Established in 1969, it is located within the Culiacán city limits, and according to his website, it's an option for anyone looking for a final resting place. It's a cemetery. <laughs> there are maps and prices, although the monthly maintenance costs ex exceed the average cost of living for Mexicans. But this is not a regular cemetery. The cost and the tradition says that this is not for anyone. It is a narco necropolis. As with all things narco, it is a cemetery of excess and extremes. It is a necropolis, a true city of the dead, with roads, Wi-Fi, and cable access, functional plumbing, satellites, playgrounds, security cameras, and of course, tombs. The dead rule this city, and the only living things that exist within its limits are the few construction workers building the next tomb, the trees that line the main avenues, and my guide and I at that time. This is a tomb in the Jardines de Omaya. Um, it's insane. It's huge. Inside is fully, fully furnished. Uh, electricity running through it, uh, water, uh, air conditioning, and heating, everything. Everything you can find. Okay. There's another one. Uh, this belongs to uh, Arturo Bertrán Leiva, who was a very famous narco in Mexico, gunned down in 2010, I think. Uh, this one has its own playground and its own parking structure. Um, like that, that one is pretty intricate. I don't know who that belongs to, but I'm sure he had money. Um, that's another one. Like, that one threw me off, right? Because it looks like a modern apartment building. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the average cost of these places, of these tombs, is $650,000, which in Mexico is quite a bit of money. I mean, it's a quite a bit of money here, <laughs> but over there, it's, all, it's quite a bit of money. Uh, the Jardines is a revered and almost holy place to the people of Sinaloa. In order to visit, as, as a foreigner, my host had to get special permission and not from the government. I'm not sure who he called or what kind of permission we received, but after, ten, uh, after a 10-minute conversation, I was allowed in. This is a place that preserves the memory of cultural heroes, so the utmost respect is demanded before one enters a place and while one is there. There is a common, complete absence of graffiti on the walls. There is no garbage on the ground. A few dead or wilted flowers here and there that one assures oneself are sure to be replaced at any time. There are no wandering tourists snapping selfies. One goes quietly and reverently so as to not disturb the inhabitants. In the dead quiet of the place, there is an expectation that is almost alive, loud, and authoritative. There is a threat of violence that pierces the warm air. This respect is just not allowed. Calling Los Jardines an Acropolis, however, doesn't do it justice. The tombs are houses, as you can see. The architectural style varies from house to house, depending, I suppose, on the preferences of the narco that while he lived, uh, uh, ordered this construction. It's like, a, it's like a, an Egyptian pharaoh kind of thing, you know? A house in the Baroque style sits authoritatively next to a col colorful two-story modernist style building, while behind it, a postmodern three-story tower with see-through window panes reaches for the sky. Another interesting thing about these tombs is that they all have bulletproof glass windows. 
Why? I don't know. Right? <laughs> now, I've seen these kinds of apartments in streets and houses in the lux luxurious areas of San Francisco, but no one lives here. No one lives here. These homes furnished with sofas, televisions, air conditioning, heating, plumbing are the homes of the dead. The necropolis is the home of some of the most notorious gangsters in Mex recent Mexican history. Entombed in the same lavish tradition as Egyptian pharaohs and Mayan snake kings, the narcos built for themselves a final resting place to reflect the life that they led. Now, this one here, uh, this tomb belongs to uh, a narco in uh, that if you, turn on the, if you turn on the radio and put it on uh, 92.3, uh, you're likely to hear a song dedicated to this guy. Um, there's dozens of songs dedicated to this the particular guy. His name is Manuel Torres. And uh, his fame is that he killed over 2,000 people with his own hands. Right? And uh, then the, he was finally gunned down by the Marines. But he already had a place to go, as you can see. Uh, now, this place uh, has uh, security ca cameras on the top uh, of the thing. So, you know, maybe to protect from looters, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Um, so, the, what what these what the Jardines speak to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it speaks to the allowances of a, of a culture. Uh, this cemetery didn't force its way into a plot of land on the outskirts of Culiacan. It was methodologically planned, financed, and constructed. It was allowed. It is a symbolic gesture of the culture of El Narco itself. It is a testament to a cultural consciousness that glorifies material accumulation and excess. Los Jardines doesn't glorify death as much as it glorifies a life lived for the sake of economic success in that culture. The tombs are thus reminders and permanent symbols of a violent culture. They justify the permanence of the culture, its, defi its defiance of its own, and it, and it is defiance of its own, its, its own death. Los Jardines is a cultural landmark. Not a cultural landmark belonging to Mexican culture, but to narco culture itself. Uh, and this is my point. When we zero in on a particular culture's philosophies of death, we have authenticated its cultural status. It is not a sub or fringe culture. It is culture, period. And this because locating the role that death plays within any culture can be gathered by looking at the rights of death practiced by members of that culture. We know what the, Egypt the Egyptians, the Mayans, and the Vikings thought about death their own death and, the death and death in general by the way they were buried. And from this, we gather an insight into how they lived. And as one mourner in Los Jardines put it, we have narco culture running through our veins. Um, and so to me, when, when, I see, uh, when, I, when I see these cultural landmarks, I immediately assume that, OK, this is, this is really a culture that we need to reckon with. Uh, now, the thing with. Um, there's also, in, in the same city in Culiacán, there's also a cathedral dedicated to a narco saint. Uh, the narco saint is Jesus Malverde, uh, and they have an entire cathedral dedicated to this man. Now, he was a, a, a bandit at the turn of the 20th century that was gunned down by the police. And somehow or another, he was deified and turned into a saint. And people go there, well, mostly narcos, they go there and they pay respect to this man. They take him beer and they take him money, and you know because this is and, and another part of the of, of Mexico and Michoacan, uh, another guy uh, named Nesario Moreno wrote his own Bible. Right? No, his own Bible. He took the Bible and then he rewrote it so as to benefit the narco culture somehow, <laughs> and himself, right? Because he wanted to be Jesus in, in that story. Um, so so this 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 culture is is, is crazy. I mean, it's, 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 it's alive. Um, so how much time do I have? I don't have, I, I don't have much time. But um, the, 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 what, what I end up with when I consider you know, my philosophical responsibilities to a culture that has produced 250,000 dead over the last 12 years, uh, and when I behold uh, the cultural products that it's producing, I'm convinced that this is something that we need to think about, or that I need to think about, philosophically at least. Uh, the first thing that I arrived at when I, when I was thinking philosophically about these things was violence, as this excessiveness, right? This, it is an excess of violence. Just like with everything in our culture, the tombs, violence is also excessive, right? Vi money is excessive. Everything is excessive. Uh, if you see the guy, uh, if you see a guy in, in walking down the, the, the street in Culiacan 
Um, and if he's well-dressed, he's going to be excessively well-dressed. <laughs> there's, there's this sense that excess defines success uh, in, in our culture. And, um, and the same goes with violence. Violence needs to be excessive, as we saw with those examples. So one of the things that I end up with uh, is this notion of brutality. Like, I'm thinking violence itself as a concept doesn't capture what's going on. Right? We need a different concept. Um, and the concept for me that captures that excess is brutality. And I take uh, brutality, um, hold on, let me, uh, I, ta I take brutality uh, from a German philosopher named Max Scheler, um, who it was one of the few uh, philosophers that has ever made a distinction between cruelty and brutality. And since I am running out of time, I'll just give you the, the gist of it. Uh, for Max Scheler, cruelty has to do with uh, subjective personal dispositions. Right? Uh, only subjects can be cruel. Uh, so, th so that systems or societies, you can't call them cruel. It is a subjective disposition. It's something that subjects do. They, it's subjects are cruel. Brutality, on the other hand, so he says, in contrast to cruelty, brutality is merely a disregard of other people's experience despite the apprehension of it and feeling. Thus, to regard a human being as a mere log of wood and to treat the object accordingly is not to be brutal towards them. On the other hand, it is characteristic of brutality that given merely a sense of life, undifferentiated as yet into separate experiences, given even the fact of an enhanced appearance of life or the tendency towards it, any violent interruption of this tendency is enough to mark it as brutal. Now, the way that I understand it is that Brutality doesn't is not necessarily located within a subject. Okay, it can be it can take on a cultural aspect, so that an entire culture can perform this. Right? Uh, now, what happens when when an entire culture becomes a brutal culture is that because one of the requirements for you to be brutal towards someone is that that's someone be, that someone is a person. Right? In order for you, in order for brutality to exist as a permanent condition. The first step is to turn people into objects, right? Because then you're not being brutal towards them, right? So you strip persons of their subjectivity and their personhood, you turn them into objects, and then you can be brutal all you want towards them, right? And I think that the logic of brutality has impregnated narco culture to such an extent that people wake up and they see a pile of bodies on the front of uh, their doorstep, and they don't really think twice about it. Oh, okay, that, that, that happened. Right? It desynthesizes people because it, it, there's always an assumption that whoever died, whoever died wasn't a real person. Right? Whoever died was a narco, a criminal. Right? Uh, even if they weren't involved in that, one of, the, one of the things that I hear my mom say, my mom says this all the time, when the, the, the news comes on and you know, they find 15 dead bodies in a narco fosa in Durango or somewhere. She'll say, well, they were probably involved in something bad. Right? They were probably messed up in something bad. They were probably narcos. Right? So immediately you strip their personhood, their subjectivity away, you turn them into these object bodies, and now you can dispense with them. Um, so so that's, that's, my, that's my conclusion to this whole exercise. Uh, so I'm going to stop there, and if you have any questions, you know, feel free, feel free to ask. Thank you. So thank you for coming, uh, Professor Sanchez. That's my last name, by the way. Um, I really, really enjoyed um, your topic, and I really enjoy watching these type of shows that some are fiction, some are nonfiction. So I, if I could, I would ask so many questions, but um, I guess I would ask um, two. Um, one, would you be allowed being um, kind of connected with, the, you're not connected, but you are following the culture of the Sinaloa cartel, would you be allowed to follow other cartels like the Zetas in Michoacán or anyone in Veracruz or like you mentioned Guerrero, would you be allowed to do that and um, maybe study them? Um, 
and also how um, young are the people that are getting involved with the drug cartels? Are they, do they recruit young kids and do you see the excessiveness um, in how they dress and how they play in, in young children? Um, and is, do you see any way that you think that the culture will be disrupted either by the government or um, by the community? Um, sounds like it's more of a narcissistic place there in Sinaloa and being from the Mexican culture, I think um, our culture is more of the humble people um, if you're from the farm and it just seems like I've never really thought of the Mexican culture as narcissistic like the people in Culiacán. So it's a long, a lot of questions, but it's just so intriguing to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, well, you see, let me, let me tackle that real quick. Um, as to uh, as to following uh, these these folks, I, I don't. I wouldn't do it if they paid me. Right? Uh, it's, it's dangerous. And um, the, the the folks that I that I go that I associate with in Culiacan, uh, you can tell they're they're involved. I mean, you, you can tell. <laughs> it's uh, it doesn't you know it it's, it's doesn't take much. Um, so I'll just I'll just give you a quick a quick uh, story, a quick anecdote. Uh, the first time that I that I went to Culiacan, I was uh, invited over there to speak and um okay can you hear me with this thing or am i am i making yeah okay uh so here i'll do this okay yeah so the, so the first time that that i that i went to culiacan i um uh it was um we we went to the university of uh, autonoma de sinaloa which is a humongous university so we were it was a group of us uh, presenting on on these kinds of topics um, and when I when I went up uh, to speak, my talk was on brutality, like that that stuff that I didn't get to today. But it's a very philosophical talk where I make these distinctions between terror, horror, brutality, and cruelty. And so I'm just being very conceptual about it, right? And uh, and I'm talking, and, and I notice uh, that the room is not like this, but it's you know it's a regular room. And in, in this side of the room uh, was a bunch of people that were very well dressed uh, with suits. Uh, you know, they were all wearing ties, black suits, you know, they just looked like businessmen. And then in the back there, you had all the press. So you had, uh, you have cameras and you have people taking notes and pictures and stuff. And then on this side, you had, uh, this other line of folks that were all dressed in like Gucci and, and, uh, very fancy shoes and very fancy looking belts, right? Um, and, uh, and I'm talking and I'm not paying any mind to this, right? Uh, and then finally, when, once I'm done, everybody leaves, and I asked my, my host, I said, who are those people? And he says, well, the people on that side were the politicians. Right? They, were making, they, 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 they came here to make sure that you didn't say anything bad about the government. Ah. And the people there, of course, were the press, and they just want you to say something bad about the government. And then the people over here on the, on the right-hand side, those were the, the friends of the, of the lady, right? And the lady is basically the woman that runs the town. They were the friends of the lady. And they were here to make sure you didn't say anything bad about them. I go, okay, well, I'm glad that I was completely abstract. Right? <laughs> I was so abstract with my presentation. I was like, all right, good. I'm, never, I'm always going to pay attention to that. So at that moment, I realized that, no, I can't go down to Tamaulipas and start you know, talking about this kind of thing uh, with another group. Or, a, or a, where another group lives. So I, my, my, my lesson there was to keep everything very abstract, right? to just be philosophical about this. Uh, and, that's, and that's what, I, what I'll do. As to the children, um, there is a, a growing number. Uh, uh, that the involvement of the children is growing by the day, right? Especially when, uh, as, as, as poverty and unemployment grow, the children, children get more and more involved in the practices of the narco culture. Uh, they're not going around uh, killing people, but they serve as what they call halcones, right? Which uh, lookouts, right? They have lookouts everywhere. And um, if another cartel comes in and they see a bunch of kids uh, serving as lookouts, they'll go and they'll they'll shoot them up, you know? Halcones, yeah, yeah, like hawks. Um, and uh, and then there's the, 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 there was this gruesome story that came out not too long ago where uh, the uh, the government captured a bunch of uh, teenagers. Uh, belonging to one of the cartels, and uh, they confessed that one of the one of the rites of initiation to become part of the 
the cartel was to cannibalize other people, right? So they were feeding them the, their enemies. Uh, they would kill a, a, a guy from, from another cartel, and then they would feed it to these teenagers. And then once you eat the guy, then now you're part of the, of the thing. So children are getting more and more involved, and the practices are getting even more gruesome. And then finally, you, tie, you, you ask about the government. Uh, the government is a narco government. <laughs> uh, the, the, the government in Mexico is so intimately tied with what's going on in narco culture that, um, that you can't make the, dis uh, the uh, discriminating distinction anymore. I mean, it's, these guys are making so much money. Right? According to the United Nations, in 2017, uh, there was $154 billion dollars at play just in the Americas, $154 billion. And a lot of uh, that is in Mexico because the Colombians kind of fell off a long time ago. So a lot of the money is being made in Mexico. It's running through Mexico. And so the politicians are looking at, that, at those billions and saying, I want a piece of that. Right? And they're getting a piece of that. Um, and so, so it's, it's very, it's very close-knit. And, uh, you know, and it doesn't take anything away from the people, right? The people are wonderful. Some of the narcos that I've met are great human beings. Like, as, you know, they're really nice and generous and kind. But then at the same time, you don't want to be hanging out with them after 6 o'clock, right? Like, you don't know what's going on. Professor Sanchez, I want to thank you for a very rich presentation. Um, I want to ask you a, a theoretical kind of question. Um, someone looking at this from a different angle, perhaps a political scientist, uh, might choose the term terrorism as an expression of excessive violence. Because the reason that people use excessive violence, who are terrorists, is to, to terrorize. Um, so I would be very surprised if you haven't thought about this already. So I assume you intentionally chose brutality over terrorism. And I wonder if you could explain to us why you made that choice. Yeah, so, so this is one of those uh, philosophical uh, puzzles that I had to solve in my head. Right? Uh, and and here, here it is. It has, to do with, it has to do with some practices in archiculture that I find completely abhorrent. And one of these practices is the practice of making pozole or making soup. Now, this practice requires that the, um, it involves, uh, the, it's, it's a practice that involves liquefying other human beings so as to get rid of all traces of their existence, right? It requires that if, if you capture a guy that's an enemy, first you kill him, obviously, and then you turn him into soup. And so there's kitchens all over Mexico that turn people into soup. Uh, and so what, once this person is turned into soup, they're gone. No traces. No humanity. They never existed. Now, to me, that practice, or I mean, uh, the, the more I read about that practice, one of the, one of the, characteristics, of the pra of, one of the characteristics of that practice is that it is meant never to be seen. Right? In other words, it should happen in anonymity. That's a brutal practice. Brutal. But it's not terror. It's not terror, because one of the one of the characteristics of terrorism is it's 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 optics, right? You have to see it. You have to see it. There's there's this it's, uh, terrorism exists within the logic of the spectacle, right? You have to see it to be terrorized by it, and to keep people in check. But these other practices, like the making soup practice and other practices that exist, like the narco fosas even, are meant to be clandestine. Clandestine, clandestine. They're meant to not be seen. So, so because brutality allows us to consider cases where that, that involve spectacle and cases that involve anonymity and silence and all of that, that's why it shows brutality over terrorism. Because terrorism says that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this to frighten you. But the neoliberal economic model that informs narco culture doesn't allow for terrorism that much right? because they don't want to scare everybody because then the money will start drying up. Right? So that's why. One more. Okay, one more question.
Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't... Uh, oh, the, the question was, what, he, he's wondering why there's so much hatred in that culture. Um, uh, I, don't think there, I don't think it's hatred. I mean, I, I think that there's, obviously, there's rage or, you know, that you need some sort of anger to do the things that you're doing. But I don't think uh, hatred is motivating people to try to erase somebody's existence. I think it's money. Um, and I think it's, um, and, and, you know, in, in my class, uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm talking about this, I'm think, uh, I, I say, okay, well, why would it benefit somebody to erase another person from the face of the earth? Well, maybe they're an obstacle to my economic ends. Right? And so in that case, it, the erasure comes without anger. It's like, I'm going to erase you. So, so I, that, that's one of the things that I wanted to avoid, too, like when I talked about barbarism. You know, I don't think that um, the, the culture itself is barbaric, savage, or filled with hate. You know, I think that it's just responding to a particular project that it has for itself. So I wanted to, on behalf of the folks here today, I wanted to thank Professor Sanchez, um, providing a bridge um, for trying to help us understand and uh, to show us that philosophy is not dead. You <laughs> <laughs> may deal with elements of this. So extend, once again, our appreciation to Dr. Sanchez. <laughs>